Remember this one thing. He is risen. And if you're not sure what that's about, I've seen it by a number of people who said, if you want to know what it's about, that he died for me, so I live. So there might be a quiz at the end. All right. After the Sabbath, dawn on the very first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and if you wonder, you look at other gospel accounts, it's Mary, mother of James, not the brother of Jesus, but James the Lesser. There's a few James involved there. You just go look it up. It lists the 12 disciples, the apostles. And they went to the tomb. Why did they go to the tomb? Because, just to fill in the gaps, I mean, Jesus came into town riding a donkey, fulfilling prophecy, the great commotion against a Roman and Jewish rulers and ended in Judas having the devil come inside of him, betrayed Jesus, he looked for an opportune time to turn Jesus over to the authorities, and he did, and he said, the one to come up and kiss, that's the one. They snatched Jesus. It was a mock trial, which led to the crowd crying out to crucify him, and the Romans relented, put him on the cross. Jesus died, put him in the tomb, and three days later, here we are. If you have questions, see me after this. Now, it was a Sabbath weekend, and really they couldn't, they were in a rush to get the body ready. So they only kind of sort of prepared with spices and such, but they had other work to do, and they came in to check out the tomb, and there were guards there, and they wanted to properly, you know, take care of Jesus for his burial. So that, that's where we are when they went to look at the tomb. But then suddenly, and if you've seen this happen at a, at a funeral before, just stop me. If you've seen any of these things. Anyone been to a funeral where there was an earthquake? Oh good, this is new for you. Okay, so there was a violent earthquake. And an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and sat upon it. Now, I have been in churches where they must have like a million dollar Easter budget. Where I've seen like the paper mache tomb with smoke and sound effects and explosions and the, you know... And the big old styrofoam, you know, rock rolls out of the way and everyone goes, <gasps> but does it get him any closer to Jesus? I don't know. <laughs> Use the power of imagination here that the, that the world was, you know, in that area was shaking and there was this big glowing guy coming out of the sky. You say, how do you know it's a glowing guy? Because it says so in a minute. Came down, rolled away the stone in front of the tomb and then it goes on. It's like, now, I'll tell you why it looks like a big glowing guy here. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. And to those of you who have been following along on Wednesday nights, and we've been talking about angels and angelic visions, Ezekiel, Daniel, and we're going to wrap up with John this coming Wednesday about his vision of heaven. You say, wait, that sounds so very familiar. I'm glad I showed up for Bible study on Wednesday nights. Six o'clock every Wednesday. That wasn't over the top, was it? No. You can say, that sounds just like those angels we've been talking about with the flashes of lightning and the glowing. It's like, how would you know it's an angel? Well, here in Matthew, it says an angel. In some of the other Gospels, it says a man. Now, you say, now what sort of man looks like lightning and then is glowing and could fly and can move a giant stone? Raise your hand if that describes any of you. Didn't think so. Some of you may go to the gym, but probably not beefy enough to roll away that big stone. So I'm going with angel. The text says angel. And it says an angel of the Lord. Now, some people get confused because from way back in Genesis, where it talked about an angel of the Lord, some people said, well, that's an expression, a manifestation of Jesus. Well, I would be in agreement with you for the most part, but unless Jesus is in two places at the same time, and that's actually Jesus you know, who was in the tomb but decided he was going to fly above to heaven and come back and roll away the stone. My money is on and is more likely to be a great angel like Gabriel, who was in the pro who was always, he was one of the ones that would be the announcer great angel saying, well, by the way, you know, he talked he talk to prophets, he talked to Mary, Joseph. When before Jesus was born, I see no reason why he, he can't he can't do extra duty years later and just show up and roll away the stone and make an announcement because he does talk. Bright long robe worn and insane. In case you want to fill in the gaps, 
when he was wearing white as snow as a bright long robe worn by the upper class in the east. So people would recognize him as, wow, that's a well-to-do looking guy. And it says that the guards were so afraid. Now, you can say, oh, those are simple and sophisticated people. You know, some of you might say, I see angels every day. I'm not impressed. No. Because, my goodness, imagine you were on guard duty, probably the guard duty that no one wanted to sit there and guard a tomb because of this troublemaking prophet from Nazareth, you know, had, was there. And we had to make sure that his disciples didn't come in and steal the body and make up the story about Jesus rising from the dead like he said he was going to. They're there. And then all of a sudden, there was an earthquake. If that wasn't bad enough, I'd probably be ready to leave the area if there was an earthquake under my feet, literally. But there was this guy who came floating down, glowing, flashing like lightning. And if that wasn't cool enough, he obviously was physically there. This wasn't a vision. He rolls away this, st this stone, not someone to be messed with. So, of course, they're shaking literally in their boots. And it's the same word that's used for the shaking of the ground in the earthquake, the, what, the shaking that was going on, a commotion in their own hearts. Shaking on the ground, shaking in their hearts. They're shaking all around, and they just didn't know what to do. They said they were like dead men. Have any of you ever had a panic attack where you just felt like you couldn't breathe, couldn't move, couldn't do anything? I'm sure it was this up to the nth degree, because what they just saw, oh my goodness. Like dead men. And the angel, and he's like, oh, you're just exaggerating. No one was really that scared. No, but the angel said to the women, and we know there's at least two in other Gospels, there was Salome, but that's another part. But we just got Mary and Mary. That's the focus here. He said to the women, do not be afraid. So they must have been afraid too. Is there anyone in this room who wouldn't have been afraid of seeing all of those things? I just, you know, someone touches me on the shoulder when I don't know they're there, and I'm like that. And I can only imagine this scene. And he said, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. And if you're wondering what that means, if that's not a word you usually talk, usually use in everyday conversation, to be crucified means that he was literally fixed, nailed to a cross. And that word, if you want to be a little more educated, is staros. And there's a band I know in, in Baltimore, Maryland, I didn't know for years. They call themselves Staros because it means the cross. So they're jamming for the lamb there. And the angel said to the women, He is not here. He is, in fact, risen just as he said. Who said it? Jesus. He says, Come and see the place where he lay. Literally, where he was laid. So if he was laying, what does that imply? He's not there anymore. And if you weren't sure if that's what I'm talking about, he says he's not there. He is risen. And literally it's about, it says that he woke up and he got up. I mean, because you know, Jesus had used similar language where he talked about Lazarus being asleep and he was going to go wake up his friend Lazarus. So it's that same kind of language, that idea that he got up, that he was raised from the dead, just like he raised Lazarus from the dead. This is a preview of the power of Jesus power of the Spirit, the power of the Father working through all of this, that was a preview, in case you were not here, that was a preview of the power of God to be able to raise someone from the dead, because Jesus says, I am the resurrection of life, and here he says that, and before that he said, before he went to the cross, I have the power to lay down my life, power to raise my life back up, and for you too, and there he is, just like he said he was going to, raised from the dead. He had used a parable where he had talked about, well, this generation wants a sign, they're going to have the sign of Jonah, it's going to, I'm, who, who was in the belly of the, the fish for three days. So it's going to be with the Son of Man. And this was just symbolic language to talk about the grave. Three days later, up he rose. And they're just wondering, why did he have to stay in the ground for three days? Because they knew, if you were in the ground for three days, you were probably, what, really dead. You know, some, some people have near death experiences and pop their up and say, were they really dead? But if you're in the ground for three days, sealed in a tomb, trust me, you're dead. So there he is, up. And the angel said, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Now I have told you. So the now, just imagine, place your, place, your spot in there. You were there 
all sad and sorry, ready to just bring your anointing oil and your spices and all that, just to make sure that the you know dead Jesus smells nice in the afterlife. And then you find out, wait a minute, he's not here, and there's an angel, and there's an earthquake, and everyone's just, everyone's afraid. It says they hurried away, and you get the idea when they hurried away. They weren't just fast stepping it out of there. I mean, oh my goodness. It's like an angel just told me to get out of here and go tell. I like to think that in some ways we have a similar response to the call and command of Jesus in our life. That when he tells us something, we say, you know, that's important. Let's go. But as I look around me, this is not me fussing, just making an observation. I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining. In the church of Jesus Christ, that's all of us. We know, we know the Lord is, is, is Savior and Lord, that you would think we'd be a little quicker to respond to, hey, this is important, why don't you go and tell? So here's a preview here of what Jesus is going to tell his disciples in a short period of time. Go and tell. Simple thing, what? That he is risen. And of course, we know that they go tell the disciples, and, and being that male-dominated society, they were like, not going to take a testimony of women, and they had to come back and look for themselves. And they found out, and said, you know, it's true. And in not once did I hear them apologize to the women. <laughs> Man. But anyhow, so they hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. Have you ever had mixed emotions about a, a situation where you were all jumbled up inside, but still you were excited about it? You weren't maybe sure what to do, you know, because you were like, oh my goodness, what we just saw. And we were still sad about Jesus being dead. Wait a minute, he's alive. He's not there. So all this jumbled up in them, and off they went. Still, scared, but filled with joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. And just as they're hot-footing it down the road back to tell the disciples, suddenly, Jesus meets them, and he says greetings, literally meaning rejoice. Now, why would he tell them to rejoice? I'm going to wait. Because he's not dead. He is risen. Risen indeed. My goodness. That would be, be the coolest. I can imagine the coolest thing. To see the risen Jesus. For to be the first ones to see him. And they came to him, and they were so excited. That it says they clasped his feet and worshipped him. Literally, it's like, when they're talking about worship back then, oftentimes it is, a, it is matched up with a physical expression, just like when the wise men fell down at the feet of the infant Jesus, faces to the ground. When you realize... In your head, and if not on your lips, but in your heart, you say, oh my Lord. And you realize in whose presence you're really in. It's like, are you just going to stand there? No. You, get, you just say, I am really, that, is that expression as we use in you know, modern day language, I am not worthy. And bam, you're on the ground. Because you know you're not, and he is. And they worshiped him, just loving on him. But Jesus cut, cut that short. You know, that's, you know, he didn't say that was great, but he says, and Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my disciples to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And off they went. Now, there's probably not a person in this room who doesn't know this story in some detail. I mean, you take the polls out there, and most people believe in God, whether they want to admit, to God, they want to admit it or not. There's some people who believe in God but don't know what to do with it. Plenty are in that boat. Some people don't want to say anything about it. Some people you know, might have arguments to the contrary, but in their heart of hearts, they know. And I've known people say, well, I, I believe in God, but I'm not sure what to do about the Bible. And I've known people say, well, but I know that God is calling me. He wants me to believe in him. And God sorts out the details later. There are people who look at this and say, well, maybe it was all a mistake. Maybe it was a mass hallucination. Maybe it was this. Maybe it was that. And I just tell you, and some of you have this, should have the same personal testimony, where you say, I have met Jesus. I am not delusional. He has delivered me from the way I used to be to where I am now. And even in the simple things, you say, well, how do you know that he's been walking with you and, and gifting you and enabling you and empowering you? It's like I tell you, out of nowhere, a good 40 years ago, for better or worse, I had no gift of gab. I mean, I was just like this in front of people. And he took that away. That same Jesus last week we were talking to to bring me relief in my, in my legs. You know, I, I don't think it was 
the Easter Bunny who took away my pain. All they would have had to do, and this is one of the simple, if you want to use that bigger, that five cent word, biblical apologetics. All they would have had to do in the last 2,000 years is dig up the bones of Jesus and parade them through the streets. Did they do it that first year, the second year, 10 years, 100 years? Any time in there? No. Solid, I mean, and there are things that we believe out of history that only have one or two sources that we just take as God's honest truth. And there are historians of the age, reputable people, who report, yes, Jesus did die. And then you just look at it, and I saw this quote, and I, and I like it. Concerning the, the Watergate scandal. And it was said that there was a, a dozen guys involved in that. And they couldn't, and if, and if it... And they tried to keep their mouth shut and maintain that lie they weren't involved. And it only took them a little while before they broke down and just confessed. Now here you are, for decades after, if this was a lie, the resurrection of Jesus, you would think that one of those 12 would have cracked and said, oh, we were just making it up. We didn't know what we were talking about. But no, they spent decades going around telling everyone, if it was a lie, why would they be risking their life? I mean, and how would all those people come to know Jesus? Was it a mass delusion? I don't think so. The world around them changed. It became an empire based on faith. For better or worse, and what we've done in the name of religion, we'll just leave that to the side. But if it was just confusion, you think somebody would have been, they would have untangled that mystery a long time ago. And you know if I talk to anyone here who knows Jesus personally, you say, what do you think you're mistaken? Come on. Now, I say, I know the story. I, and there are people who tell me, I know, I believe that Jesus went to the cross, and they'll even say he died for my sins, but there's a disconnect, and there's a but. What do we do with that? And maybe the church, and I'm, and I'm, I'm just seconds away of wrapping this up, just, so stay, stay with me here. The church oftentimes doesn't know what to do with that. They tell the story, and then, then next week we'll be talking about something else. And you know, you really, in some places, you won't hear serious talk about Jesus until we're near Christmas time again. Then back to Easter, which is when I see some of you folks in church. Those two holidays. You say, well, what is the connection, the connecting piece? Then it's all fine to know that he is risen, and you believe he rose from the dead, and he's there for me. But... What we're missing out on is what they did, the disciples. Because towards the end of this chapter, Jesus says, you know, meet me in Galilee. And, he, and in Galilee, he tells them, you go out and you make disciples. And that, that is, teach people to be like me, to be like yourselves, followers of Jesus. Teaching them everything I had commanded you. And baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they did just that. And they were awesomely empowered 50 days later, the day of Pentecost, with the Holy Spirit, where they had the power to speak in other languages and all sorts of gifts, sign gifts as we call them, to lay hands on people, heal people, drive out demons, all sorts of stuff. But the main thing is they went and they told people about Jesus. And I can just stand here and say, well, and you know, people, that's what we need to do. And everyone said, amen. And I said, let's pray. And we go home and we remained unchained, unchanged. But I say, you know, we're missing the point of the story if it stays here on the page. And we say, and, Je and Jesus is risen, but what do I do with it? We go and we tell. And, it's, and then some people say, well, Pastor Bob... Can you go a little deeper? And I said, well, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, thank you for reminding me, but what do I do with that? And I say, well, go and tell. You know what you need to know. But there are, I say that, and there are people here who say, there's no way in the world I'm going to stand up out of this pew and tell anybody about Jesus. I'm afraid. You know what they did? A lot of them went together. Prayer partners, ministry partners. Now, and there's no shame, there's no, there's no fear 
you, that can't be overcome. There's no shame in you saying, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know what to say. You know, say, Pastor Bob, could you help me? Could you pray for me? Pray with me? You know, I'm, if this happens to you and you wonder why people show up all of a sudden want to take you out to dinner, let me just tell you the secret here. Maybe the other people won't be listening. That we can pair up. If there's someone in your life that needs to hear about Jesus, you know, it doesn't have to be me. It can be other people here who say, hey, why don't we go out for a cup of coffee? Just a natural conversation thing. You know, could you help? Could you pray with me about so-and-so? They need to know Jesus. I don't know what to say. You know, I can help you fill in some of those gaps. I don't mind. I have the time for that. That's why I'm here. That's why we're all here. And in fact, right after we had this... Uh, this last Bible study on, on angels on Wednesday, I'm starting a new unit, this book about soul winning, about how, how to communicate properly the gospel by Charles Spurgeon, an amazing evangelist. Tons of people in church. I mean, he was always telling people about Jesus. And sometimes that's all you need to hear is, someone, is just to hear a fresh word about how someone else did that. And we're going to sit, we're going we're gonna to spend a handful of weeks breaking that down, encouraging each other, maybe doing a little role play, just reminding you about how to tell the story, build some confidence. And you say, but Pastor Bob, where is the field work? I'm glad you're all here hanging in for the last minute. It's been a while, and I don't want to blame everything on the pandemic, but before the pandemic... There was an open door on Wednesday afternoons, and we could find other times when I would meet down at Cummings Coffee Shop at noon with a good friend of mine, AJ, who's gone off to the military to do other things. We would meet, we would prayer walk, we would just be there hanging out literature, talking to people about Jesus, and we could do that other times. You know, you and I could walk together somewhere in the streets of Butler, in your neighborhood, you know, sitting at someone's house. You know, we don't have to make it too obvious that's where we're there, but building relationships, praying that God will open a door, give opportunities. You know, we are, to use that overworked expression, we're in this together. You know, just because I, I don't want it to be something I just say here and then it just fades away into the, the carpet and, and sitting in the pew residue here of where you were warming it up. You know, it, the church of the first century understood they needed to put feet to their faith and go out there and tell people. The church of the 21st century we just need to be reminded to close that gap that we are still in the disciple-making, Jesus-sharing business. That is, Jesus didn't flip the script and tell us to do something else. We are still about sharing the good news about how you know Jesus, how you, how you come, come to know him in faith, how you live and serve for him, with him, and, and allow him to work through you. If you've got questions... Maybe just at how you get to know Jesus personally, how you become a member of this church. You say, well, I know, I just need, I need to be baptized. I just need to fill in some gaps. I need to be fed. We have opportunities on Sunday morning, Bible study, women and men, Wednesday night, hear from the pulpit. You know, if anyone you wants to start a Bible study in your own house, I won't stop you. I will encourage you. If you need some help, let me know. We will work together to get the word out. As our mission study is, our focus is, make Jesus known. Let's do that together and be obedient to the calling of Jesus in our life. Let's pray.